Hi, this is Sarah from the Bay County Public Library. And Shelly from the League of Women Voters of Bay County. And we are so excited to partner on this program where we're exploring the journey that women had to um, be able to vote. And yes, Sarah, uh, can you believe it's been a hundred years since women gained the right to vote? And in this monumental election year, it's an important time for us to highlight what women actually went through uh, the decades-long struggle to attain this right to vote. So we're excited that uh, with the library's many educational programs, we can add this to what is available to educate our public this year. The 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution was ratified on August 18, 1920. To celebrate this momentous occasion and the decades-long struggle that led women gaining the right to vote, we want to share some of the notable individuals involved in women's suffrage. One of my favorite historians, John Henry Clark, had this to say about us focusing on history. History is not everything, but it is a starting point. History is a clock that people use to tell their political and cultural time of day. It is a compass they use to find themselves on the map of human geography. It tells them where they are, but more importantly, what they must be. It was Seneca Falls, New York, site of the first Women's Rights Convention in July of 1848, where the women's suffrage movement in the United States was launched. Seneca Falls was selected because it was the home of organizers Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott. They were called to action after an earlier experience being barred from attending the World Anti-Slavery Convention in London eight years earlier because of being women. They committed to make change happen. It was here in Seneca Falls where Elizabeth Cady Stanton presents her Declaration of Sentiments, creating the agenda of women's activism for decades to come. It was modeled after the Declaration of Independence beginning with, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. Among these sentiments was the right to vote. Part of her speech included, the right to vote is ours, have it, we must, use it, we will. They knew this would be met with resistance. However, the declaration was signed by 68 women and 32 men, including abolitionist Frederick Douglass, who we will speak about more in a moment. As with every effort to expand the franchise, there was pushback against women's suffrage from many men and even some women. Elizabeth Cady Stanton's own husband disagreed with his wife on the right to vote. Talk about a house divided. These images are from the Library of Congress archives. The first image is men picking up anti-suffrage pamphlets at the National Association headquarters opposed to women's suffrage. The cartoon includes a hen with a votes for women sash saying, sit on them yourself, old man, my country calls me. And the rooster says, why, Ma, these eggs will get all cold. And it notes that a vote for federal suffrage is a vote for organized female nagging forever. Let's consider the historic significance here. The biggest fear then, and in modern times as well, is if women are granted more power to make choices for themselves, how will family life be affected? What will change? And who will suffer? Two years after Seneca Falls, the first National Women's Rights Convention was held in Worcester, Massachusetts, leading to an annual convention. Lucy Stone, Sojourner Truth, William Lloyd Garrison, and Frederick Douglass were convention speakers. Lucy Stone, who helped organize the event as secretary, and she spoke at the end. We want to be something more than the appendages of society. We want that women should be co-equal and help meet of man in all the interests and perils and enjoyments of human life. We want that she should attain to the development of her nature and womanhood. We want that when she dies, it may not be written on her gravestone that she was the relict of somebody. While Susan B. Anthony, future suffragist, was not there, Stone's words printed in the convention booklet made her want to join the cause, which she later did, for decades of activism. She was even arrested for voting in 1872. Another speaker, Sojourner Truth, 
was born into slavery in 1797 as Isabella Balmfrey. She was able to walk away free from slavery after the New York anti-slavery law of 1827. Isabella changed her name to Sojourner Truth in 1843 and became active in both the anti-slavery and women's rights movements. At a two-day women's rights convention held in Akron, Ohio in 1951, she delivered her famous speech, Ain't I a Woman? Well, children, where there is so much racket, there must be something out of kilter. I think that twixt the Negroes of the South and the women at the North all talking about rights, the white men will be in a fix pretty soon. But what's all this here talking about? That man over there says that women need to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches and to have the best place everywhere. Nobody ever helps me into carriages or over mud puddles or gives me any best place. And ain't I a woman? Look at me. Look at my arm. I have plowed and planted and gathered into barns and no man could head me. And ain't I a woman? I could work as much and eat as much as a man when I could get it and bear the lash as well. And ain't I a woman? I have borne 13 children and seen most all sold off to slavery. And when I cried out with my mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me. And ain't I a woman? Then they talk about this thing in the head. Uh, what's this they call it? Uh, intellect. That's it, honey. What's that got to do with women's rights or Negroes' rights? If my cup won't hold but a pint and yours holds a quart, wouldn't you be mean not to let me have my little half measure full? Then that little man in black there, he says women can't have as much rights as men cause Christ wasn't a woman. Where did your Christ come from? Where did your Christ come from? From God and a woman. Man had nothing to do with it. If the first woman God ever made was strong enough to turn the world upside down all alone, these women together ought to be able to turn it back and get it right side up again. And now they is asking to do it, the men better let them. Obliged to you for hearing me, and now old Sojourner ain't got nothing more to say. The powerful speech shared her life's hardships. The anti-slavery news article shared her speech, saying it is impossible to transfer it to paper or convey any adequate idea of the effect it produced upon the audience. Those only can appreciate it who saw her powerful form, her whole soul, earnest gestures, and listened to her strong and truthful tones. A strong alliance is formed with the abolitionist movement. Not just women's rights were being fought because slavery is still taking place at this time. The Civil War doesn't officially begin until 1861. The Emancipation Proclamation was not until January 1863, presented by President Abraham Lincoln in an executive order that said all persons held as slaves are and henceforward shall be free. The most famous speaker at the first National Women's Convention was Frederick Douglass. Douglass was born into slavery, but was taught to read and write by his master's wife at great risk to them both because it was illegal to teach slaves to read and write. Literacy equipped him to escape to freedom. As he became a vocal anti-slavery activist, that also made him a target where he fled to safety to Europe until his freedom was purchased by Quakers. He returned and founded an abolitionist newspaper, became an internationally renowned journalist, orator, and influenced Abraham Lincoln on the issue of slavery being central to winning the Civil War. He fought for equality throughout his life and became known as the father of civil rights movement that was a hundred years before Martin Luther King. After the Civil War ended in 1865, 
A new organization was formed by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony to demand universal suffrage. The American Equal Rights Association was created on May 10, 1866. The goal was to secure equal rights to all American citizens, especially the right of suffrage, irrespective of race, color, or sex. In 1869, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony formed a more radical institution, the National Women's Suffrage Association, or NASA, to achieve the vote through a constitutional amendment as well as push for other women's rights issues. Frederick Douglass and Lucretia Mott were involved in the organization, but NASA opposed the 15th Amendment, which gave African American men the right to vote, unless it included the women's right to vote as well. This created a fracture in the suffrage movements. Frederick Douglass separated himself from Anthony and Stanton over their position. The 15th Amendment was passed by Congress in 1869 and ratified in 1870. The women were not happy. With more than 50 years of activism still ahead, NASA advocated for a 16th Amendment that would dictate universal suffrage. Susan B. Anthony was born into a Quaker family committed to social equality. She collected anti-slavery petitions starting at the age of 17. Susan traveled around the country with Elizabeth Cady Stanton giving women's rights speeches demanding the right to vote. Carrie Chapman Catt joined the suffrage movement in the late 1880s. She was elected president of NASA to succeed Susan B. Anthony in 1895. Carrie Chapman Catt is largely credited with the sustained leadership that preceded the passage of the 19th Amendment. She is also the founder of the League of Women Voters. By this time, the internal divisions within the women's movement were more pronounced when Mary Church Terrell, Ida B. Wells Barnett, Harriet Tubman, and Frances E. W. Harper, among others, founded the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs in 1896. They fought for women's suffrage and against Jim Crow laws. The women also led efforts to increase access to education. Mary Church Terrell was the first president of the organization. Mary Church Terrell was the daughter of slaves and an early advocate for civil rights and the suffrage movements. She was one of the first African-American women to earn a college degree. In addition to being president of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, Terrell was a charter member of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, in 1909. She joined the National Women's Party in picketing the White House. Terrell continued to fight racial discrimination throughout her life. Here is a photograph of her in her 80s, protesting the segregated lunch counter in Washington, D.C. in the early 1950s. She's pictured in the middle. Ida B. Wells was born into slavery during the Civil War. She was a child of Reconstruction-era politics and became an investigative journalist, researcher, educator, and skilled writer who wrote to shed light on the African Americans throughout the South in the late 19th to early 20th centuries. Her international expose on lynching gave her national fame with her pamphlet called Southern Horrors, Lynch Law in All Its Phases, which posthumously received a Pulitzer Prize in 2020 for her work. Wells also helped found the NAACP. Ida B. Wells marched with the National American Women's Suffrage Association in 1913 in a notable Washington, D.C. parade. She marched linked arm in arm with her white suffrage colleagues despite a request from the Illinois delegation to keep NASA segregated. On March 3, 1913, the suffragists, led by Alice Paul and Lucy Burns, organized a parade down Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. It was held the day before President Woodrow Wilson's inauguration to maximize its impact. The parade was the first major suffrage spectacle by NASA. Marchers came from all over the nation. The purpose was to march in spirit of protest against the present political organization of society from which women are excluded. Alice Paul and Lucy Burns organized the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage in 1913, which was later known as the National Women's Party in 1916, breaking from their elder suffragists on the strategies to achieve suffrage. 
They borrowed more militant strategies from the Radical Women's Social and Political Union in England, which both Paul and Burns had taken part in. They were headquartered in D.C. to campaign for a constitutional amendment. The National Women's Party picketers appear in front of the White House. Arrest of picketers begin on charges of obstructing sidewalk traffic. Subsequent picketers are sentenced up to six months in jail. This continued even after the U.S. was active in World War I. The National Women's Suffrage Association, led by Carrie Chapman Catt, felt the group should instead support the war effort. This photograph is from 1917 and the banner reads, Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? Although they tried to avoid having their leader directly involved in the picketing and threatened lockup, Alice Paul herself was arrested and put in solitary confinement in the mental ward of the prison to break her will and to undermine her credibility with the public. She gained national attention when her hunger strike and forced feedings were exposed in the press. The government unconditionally releases the picketers in response to public outcry and an inability to stop National Women's Party picketers' hunger strike. The picture on the right is Alice Paul outside the National Women's Party headquarters in D.C. near a donation box for the cause. The Senate finally passes the 19th Amendment and the ratification process begins in 1919, which states the rights of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. The necessary three quarters of state legislatures ratified the 19th Amendment with Tennessee's votes carrying it over the top on August 26, 1920. The 19th Amendment was ratified and American women win full voting rights. Here we see Alice Paul toasting to the passage of the 19th Amendment with grape juice. 100 years of women voting. Our rights have been hard won, but we are not done. Alice Paul introduced the Equal Rights Amendment in 1921, which was fought over in the 60s and 70s, but never ratified. Women continue to fight for reproductive rights, property rights, equitable health care costs, and election to the highest office. It is important to remember that African American women and men who fought for suffrage were unable to vote due to ongoing racial discrimination until the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Too many women have spent too many years bearing oceans of sorrow, shedding too many tears for you not to vote. We encourage everyone to make sure they exercise this hard-fought right. Your voice matters. Vote by mail, now, or in person, starting October 24th. Don't forget to vote. And here are some titles in the Northwest Regional Library System for checkout. Children's titles include How Women Won the Vote, Alice Paul, Lucy Burns, and Their Big Idea by Susan Campbell Bartoletti. Bold and Brave, Ten Heroes Who Won Women the Right to Vote by Kirsten Gillibrand. Around America to Win the Vote, Two Suffragists, A Kitty and 10,000 Miles by Mara Rockliffe, and The Woman's Hour, Our Fight for the Right to Vote by Elaine Weiss. Adult titles include Suffrage, Women's Long Battle for the Vote by Ellen Carroll Du Bois, Fighting Chance, The Struggle of Women's Suffrage and Black Suffrage in Reconstruction America by Faye E. Dutton, and Ordinary Equality, Daughters of the American Revolution Members and the Road to Women's Suffrage, 1890 to 1920, which was a donation by the St. Andrews Chapter of the DAR. Films include Suffragette, and Iron Jawed Angels. And for more information, check out the PBS film The Vote, which is fantastic and streaming for free through PBS. And the 2020 Women's Vote Centennial Initiative. The Road to Women's Suffrage covers a lot of information, so there's so much more out there. Thank you for joining us.